All right, our first speaker, Dr. Juliana Barr. Dr. Barr is an associate professor of history at Duke University whose research explores dynamics of Indian European relations in North America, especially as they relate to questions of gender, political economy, diplomacy, and native sovereignty. She's the author of Peace Came in the Form of a Woman, Indians and Spaniards in the Texas Borderlands 2007, co-editor of Contested Spaces of American History 2014, and Why You Can't Teach U.S. History Without American Indians 2015. Dr. Barr will be speaking about mapping Indian sovereignty in Spanish archives. Please welcome Dr. Barr. Thank you so much, and um, this is going to be exciting. I've got to learn how to new, use a new clicker, and I've been told I can't wander from this podium, so <laughs> we're going to see how well I do. Uh, you can all yell if I walk away and you can't hear me, um, and I'll keep an eye on the images. Uh, so this morning I would like to begin um, with an acknowledgement that we are gathered here today in the territory and lands traditionally held by many ancestral people who later came to be known as the Takoa and the Lapan Apache. But I also want to recognize not simply a territorial residence of the past, but to acknowledge that descendants of these native groups still hold land as homes, residential lots, properties, all around us, and are actively involved in reconstituting state and federal recognition for their communities and their nations and it is the history of their sovereign land claims that I'm going to talk about today. So, what I want to talk about today is how Indians exerted power in their relations with Europeans and how European maps actually document this for us. So, let's look here we go, at a close-up of this map. Uh, this was drawn by Antonio Perea, who was a Portuguese um, soldier explorer. We can date it to 1545 because it actually shows evidence of knowledge of the Amazon River, the course of the Amazon River, which we know was um, traveled by uh, European explorers in 1542. So this is actually half of illuminated vellum map of the world. So this is, of course, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this shows us, in fact, uh, the sum of all knowledge gained by the Spanish and the Portuguese by that time, information primarily gathered by sea along the coastlines or from travel reports, again, um, by this trip down the Amazon. If you could see more closely and we could zoom, you would see three Portuguese uh, flags, two French flags, you can see the Florida de Lee up in North America, and 13 Spanish standards. You'll note that most of these are along the coast and some of them are on ships in the oceans approaching um, the Americas. What all those flags tell us is that maps are not just simply about the advancement of knowledge. They are about the machinations of geopolitics. Everybody can think about their children or their grandchildren who make that breathless progression from I see to I possess. Mine, mine, mine. These are all expressions of desire. They are not expressions of reality. Maps, as one cartography historian, J.B. Harley, has told us, were tools of imperialism just as much as guns and warships. Maps politically were a paper war of colored flags as Rulers in Seville and London and Paris vied for claims in the Americas. Commercially, they were promotional ads in hopes of getting investors in colonial projects. So we can see all these political economic goals going on in maps, that they're not simply documenting um, information for us. On the surface, if we were to look at Perea's map, we would think that it seems to gel quite well with what pop culture and our public history textbooks tell us. So let's look at some of those maps. We imagine somehow that the pre-Columbian um, landscape was empty, 
had much open spaces, that it was a wilderness waiting to be tamed and civilized by Europeans. If we look at these maps, Indian lands and Indian nations have no lines, no borders, no political markers. Indian towns have no names. Now please look at this map. This is supposed to be pre-Columbian America, so let's imagine it's supposed to be 1491. Please note the grayscale of the 48 states in the background of that map. So the map is already distorting any children's understanding of the pre-Columbian world by putting, in the spirit of Manifest Destiny, the 48 states over it. Now some teachers will say, oh no, but students don't know, they wouldn't be able to locate things if they can't see the state lines. And then they pause and they say, okay, we'll wait. I mean, if they knew which states were which. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and a geographer uh, once told me that of course, that grayscale of the 48 states, that's a political decision by textbook makers, right? They could have the Rockies, they could have the Appalachians, they could have rivers, they could have all sorts of topographic markers that could help students locate the landscape. This is a political decision to make all of this pre-US history, but it, is, it shifts and morphs and warps um, students' understandings of what's going on. We could also see, by the way, that I've shown you, they've got native names floating freely above the landscape. They're divided by language or by culture in all these different ways. But this notion is that, of course, they sparsely occupy the landscape, living in landless bands that move constantly, who have no claims to certain territories. So if we follow the narrative in the textbooks then, it's only um, when Europeans um, arrive that we begin to chart movement. Now notice, the map has been wiped clean. And now we do have this notion that, oh yes, these explorers must have been chopping their way through the wilderness, struggling against um, tropical rainforests and deserts and all sorts of other natural uh, challenges. But of course, that's all it is. The next maps take those nice colored flags we were looking at it and turn it into colored regions. Still imaginary, but nice colors to look at. So all of a sudden, right, now we do have lines. We've divided all of North America um, into regions claimed by different European powers. And of course, the key here is that if Indians have no borders, then they have no territorial claims then these European powers are not dispossessing anyone of their lands. So consider what it means for Europeans to divide all the Americas into a bunch of news. New France, New Spain, New Granada, New Netherlands. It rewrites all American historical spaces as somehow new creations, newly created by Europeans, and it erases both the presence of native peoples across this landscape, but it also erases their past, that they have centuries of history in these lands. Anglo-Americans were particularly adept at erasing Europeans from maps. This is a famous map by John Mitchell in which he imagines that the different colonies' borders just don't end. They just go all the way to the Pacific. Or look at Jefferson's map and his dreams for the Northwest Territory. And so he's already dividing it into individual states. You can see some of his rather interesting names for some of the states that he was uh, imagining in his mind. But of course, this is as if there are no native people there. And of course, this land can simply be taken over um, and newly possessed. <coughs> But all of this, of course, is imaginary. It's in our textbooks, but it's not in our past. This was the reality of the pre-Columbian landscape. There was no piece of land or inch of space that was not claimed by one Indian nation or another. All of it was marked and surveyed and bordered. And what's very striking is that of course those textbook maps I've just been showing you do not get their misinformation from European maps. 
European maps from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries look a lot more like this one. The reality is that when Europeans went into the woods, they did not strike out into uncharted wildernesses. They traveled along well-worn Indian thoroughfares and highways. Uh, there were Frenchmen in East Texas among the Caddo in 1685 who noted that the Caddo highways were as wide, well-beaten, and level as the highway between Orléans and Paris. When they moved across these landscapes, they found that they were subject to the laws of India's jurisdiction. They were subject to border controls, and they were subject to passport systems, as we'll talk about in a little while. There's a fantastic story in 1675 uh, in South Texas of a Franciscan missionary who was hauled before an, of a Piame chief uh, to answer charges of trespass that he had wandered across a border and was now in trouble. So Europeans were quite aware of the borders of Indian lands and nations, and their maps show it. So we might pause and say, well, why, right? They were there to conquer, they were all powerful. But that's not quite accurate at all. If we consider particularly the Spanish and the French, their colonial ventures absolutely depended upon Indian involvement and were inclusive of Indians. They had to know where to find allies, they had to know where to find trading partners, they had to know where to find potential converts for their missions. More fundamentally, they had to know whose lands they were in because their lives depended on it. I can give you the easiest example in the world. If you are a Spanish uh, resident in San Antonio and you go out traveling and you cross a river and you have now left Apacheria and you've entered Comancheria, you need to know where that border is. Your life depends upon it because if the Apaches see you as an, an if the Apaches see you as a Comanche ally or the Comanches see you as an Apache ally, you may die in crossing that border. So their lives depended upon knowing whose lands they were standing on. And by recognizing these Indian borders, by mapping these Indian borders over and over again, they were recognizing native sovereignty in its essence. And that is the power nations exert within unambiguous borders. We often imagine when we think about the early period of European Indian relations as cultural encounters, and we imagine it between individuals. And what we forget in making that leap is that Indians were nations, and when they interacted with Europeans, they were in interacting diplomatically and politically as representatives of nations with Europeans who were representatives of their empires. And it's absolutely critical that we understand this question of sovereignty in the past. We have to understand this map, because if we don't understand this map, then we can't understand this one. We can't understand what U.S. policies did by the end of the 19th century when they denied the sovereignty of Indian uh, nations and did away with them, particularly in the Dawes Act. And of course, this is a shift for the United States as well because we should keep in mind, and this is one of the easiest things my students get is, you ask, so who does the United States make treaties with? Foreign nations. Okay. So the 1,642 times they negotiated treaties with Indians, they were recognizing each and every one of those groups as a nation, as a foreign nation. And so it's a radical shift when they then, by the end of the 19th century, have denied the sovereignty of those Indian nations who are recognized in each and every one of those 1,642 treaties those treaties now, which are the greatest tool of Indian nations today fighting to regain their sovereignty. So this is why we've got to understand sovereignty in the beginning, so we can understand what's going on right now. So we can understand what's happening right now at Standing Rock, for example, what those protests are about. OK, so now let's leap way back in time um, and look at these earliest maps to begin charting how Europeans are documenting this power. When we look at the earliest maps, what becomes very striking is, of course, that they used symbolism and imagery a lot in their maps. And one of the things the Spanish loved 
were to show, well, actually Europeans in general, were to show giants. And we can speculate that, in fact, it does appear that when the first Europeans came, they did actually find many native people who were much taller than them. Because, of course, native people had far greater amounts of protein in their diet. So, in fact, they may have been much taller than Europeans. But I also think the ubiquitous nature of the number of giants who appear on maps is a sign of native power. So we've got a couple um, from South America here, and you can see the Patagonian giants here. But closer to home, and very well known, let's look at John Smith's map of Powhatan's lands. And of course, he's showing us um, the, all the sovereign lands of the Powhatan Confederacy, which included 23 tributary nations. And you've got the looming um, warrior over the map. But then also think about this. And of course, John Smith is also trying to tell you he's a man of great daring do and great achievements, and he could fight off these powerful Indians. But Open Kankano is dominating him. And so we can see signs of power in that way. We can see territorial power in their mapping of coasts. And we can go all around North America. And you can see all the Indian settlements and Indian towns along the coast. So here we are um, in Roanoke. Here we are in Plymouth. Now tell me, where are you going to land your ship if every single inch of the coast is occupied? You go up to Cape Cod, and we can look at the Gulf. And this would be the Texas coast um, along the Gulf. They also documented cities. And so if we look at Perea's map, now of course, I've told you, right, he has not entered, they don't know about the interior yet. They have, of course, been to Noctitlan, and so they are anticipating other cities. They know there will be other cities, and so he has built images of native cities as he anticipates um, what they already know to be facts about the Americas. Here is Cortez's uh, fantastic map of Noctitlan and its incredibly sophisticated um, architecture. Here is an Iroquois city documented. This is actually an Italian um, re rediagramming of this Iroquois city, Hachlaga. But what he's giving you there is he's showing you that they have triple fortifications. So they're triple walls that you have to go through. He's showing you the gate. He's showing you the inner courtyard and then how far you have to go just to get to the king's um, housing. Or if we look in uh, the northeast, and you should um, know this map is actually reversed, so of course the south is at the top and the north is at the bottom. Um, but this is a Dutch map and planning out the fur trade and how they're going to try to get into native tur fur trading networks. But if you see again, we've got a map dominated by native cities, and they are fortified cities. So these are, si these are signaling to us the military strength of the native nations that they're going to have to deal with as they seek entry into these massive trading networks where they imagine so much profit to lie. When we look at these maps, we also need to understand that, of course, they're not documenting their own knowledge that they've gained from their explorations. They're often documenting knowledge that they've gained from native people. So this is one of the earliest maps um, of the Southern Plains and of Texas and New Mexico. It was drawn in Mexico City by a Wichita Indian who the Spaniards called Miguel, um, drawn in 1602 um, from interrogations. And what it's showing you are the rivers, the highways, the Indian towns of the Southern Plains in relationship um, to the upper Rio Grande and Mexico in the bottom. Um, he's giving, and I can have a translation that's a little easier to see. He's also giving you uh, distances by the number of days traveled. But what this map is telling the Spanish, and this is of course what the Spanish are wanting to know, but this is also, this is telling us how Miguel imagines this landscape and describes it is. He's not telling you how to navigate the landscape, he's telling you how to navigate political relationships. The political relationships that link different Indian nations and the trade ties that diff link different Indian nations. So those networks that the Spanish want to go into. If we leap forward 150 years to this map, this is a French map using information gained from their trade with the Caddo and Wichita's to talk about the trading networks that link the Caddo's to the Wichita's, to the French, 
And then, of course, we also have San Antonio de Beja on there as well. And so we can see then the kinds of knowledge that these Europeans are seeking, the kinds of knowledge they're gaining from Indians. And they will say, there's no Indian who doesn't know exactly where his nation's lands ends and the next nation's begins. And they need this knowledge and they're seeking this knowledge. OK, so now I want to focus in on Texas um, and the native sovereign jurisdictions in three different regions of Texas. So I'm going to start. I'm going to guess exactly where you're going to guess with the most obvious, the kingdom of the Tejas, the nation that the Spanish would hear about for years and years before they ever entered the state, known to them as a populous and powerful nation with a king or a great lord who ruled with lieutenants over a people whose lands were so extensive, of course, as you can see, I'm giving you this map so you can see, of course, that the Caddo lands extended over Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. They had cities so numerous they extended for miles. This was one of the cities along the Red River that extended um, for 53 miles along the river. They were so powerful that their warriors were feared by all. I'm actually reading or quoting from um, a Spanish report. Um, they are so highly organized that they have a hierarchical governing system. So if we zero in the map, we can see uh, the housing of the, the caddy and the temple of the, the high priest. And you may see the um, cross that is erected beside the caddy. Of course, this was. Uh, Fray Massenet, who was in the 1691 expedition, who erected the cross as a sign of alliance with the Spanish. So that is not a sign of religious conversion. That is a sign of Spanish hope that the Caddo will become allies of theirs. The Caddo, they also learned, had an agricultural economy so successful that every community member had his own multi-storied home. They had a commercial exchange system so extensive and so profitable that it extended to New Mexico, the Gulf Coast, and the Great Lakes. They had a government so well run that when people were away on business, the government oversaw their property and their crops. And finally, and most importantly, what they would hear over and over again, it was a nation so extensive that no one knew where it ended because the great lord of the Tejas does not permit foreign nations to enter the interior of his country. So what becomes striking when you read Spanish and French expedition narratives is every single one of them went through the same extensive admission rituals over and over again. And so if you can imagine these as concentric rings around the heartland of the Caddo domain, what would happen was they would hit the outer hunting areas. And hunting groups or um, a nice family would stop them and say, oh, hi. Oh, it's so nice that you've come into our country. Why don't you stay here for just a minute? We're going to send runners into the interior, and you know, and we'll we'll get you some guides. And so they halt, and they make them stay. Then groups of warriors come from the interior, and they say, "Oh, lovely! We will now escort you." And so the Spanish and the French, oh, we've got these nice guides. And I'm like, "No, you're under guard. You are not going anywhere that they do not allow you to go." And they will talk about that they are kept to very clear highways. They are not allowed to wander around. So now, under guard, they will move through the hunting territories where they'll see various hunting lodges. Then they'll get to the next ring where they begin to see hamlets and villages surrounded by agricultural fields. Then they will get to the innermost town centers. And finally, they will reach the caddy complexes, which of course were the diplomatic heart of their political um, systems that dealt with ambassadors and foreign visitors. And so this would be where they would then finally encounter a caddy um, who would then negotiate with them in whatever political or economic um, uh, projects they were proposing. At that point, having been sussed out and deemed, OK, we don't think you're going to cause too much trouble, they would be given some sort of passport some sort of gift at the end of a ritual in which they had been purified, they had been seen to be acceptable, and they say, okay, now here's a gift. 
please take it with you if you want to move around within the Caddo domain so that when you get to the next town, they'll know you've already been checked out and been deemed acceptable. When the Spanish and the French then try to establish presidios, missions, trading posts, we need to understand that these are seen by the Caddo as embassies that are being set up. In, and you have to adhere to multiple rules of jurisdiction and where you're going to locate them. They don't build anything without Caddo permission. And again, we can see the Cad uh, French and Spanish recognition that they, of course, are ambas ambassadors in someone else's lands. If we look at this Boreo map, which is very well known, and we move into the center, right, they are showing their establishments in the midst of Caddo villages. If we then look at this later map, um, your Tia's map, and it's also, again, please note, they're saying this is the province of the Tejas. So what they're saying is, of course, it's the province of the Texas Indians, the Hassane Indians. It is not saying that it is a Spanish province. It is saying that they are residents within a Caddo province. If we then look at French maps, and I should say, in terms of talking about uh, the GLO's collections that are um, available digitally, you know, there are archival libraries across the country who are now digitalizing maps. And the most phenomenal thing about studying maps is Zoom. <laughs> because we can zoom in, like, let me look at, uh, if I show this map to my students, they're like, eh, I don't know. Well, it looks like I can see the big green thing that says where the French are claiming land. We zoom in, though, and then we say, oh, no. Actually, in fact, this is a landscape covered with native names of native nations. We zoom in more, and we see that, of course, uh, the French are just locating embassies among uh, the Sine. It's the French name for the Hassan. Or if we look at this other one, 1757, by the way. Please note that I'm not showing you maps just at the very beginning. I'm showing them in the late... Uh, 18th century as well. We zoom in again, and we find that it is the Pays de the Sine. It is the country of the Hassanai. And if I were to zoom back out and then show you details from across North America, every single one of these areas, they are saying, this is not New France. This is the land of the Sioux. This is the land of the Paducas. It is not our land. It is native land, and they are recognizing it because they must. Okay, so next example in Texas, Colteca speakers. That may seem a less obvious case. There's a certain scholarly reluctance to recognizing or associating homelands with hunter-gatherers. We imagine that they're constantly in movement. But here, too, we have very clear territorial claims and borders that they had spaces of control where they controlled certain resources. So in the summer, they would move in more co coalitions um, and shared hunting and gathering ranges. But of course, all these ranges were only used by certain affiliated groups. So there was a political alliance in force in terms of who could use certain lands. In the winters, they would divide into smaller, more exclusive territories. No movement is random in any of this migration through these uh, resource bases. They're moving in quarters. It becomes extraordinary when you start thinking that, oh, in fact, this confederated band only moves in this very narrow corridor here, and this one here. And we can again see the Spanish are documenting this over and over again in their records because they have to know where different lands are controlled by different groups. And so these shared ranges represent alliances. And they take material form in these shared encampments. And you can see, if you can see what it looks like, little checkerboards. Those are some of the largest shared encampments that the Sp Spanish would document. And they would call these the Rancheria Grandes. And they, as more and more expeditions came north, they would say, oh, if we're here during a certain period of time, this Rancheria Grande is always here. And so they're documenting these alliances. And again, we have clear territorial occupation. We go back to Berea's map, um, and then I'm gonna zoom in on it too. Henry Jutel, who was with La Salle, 
was told that the Colorado River was clearly the dividing ground between nations. He was told, we never cross the Colorado River unless we're going to war. So obviously, it's not simply a border, but it's a border between us and our enemies. The Spanish expeditions will document over and over again pictographs and rocks located and markers along highways. These are clearly territorial markers again. And the Spanish will report that, in fact, most Indian warfare in this region is about trespass. And so it's, again, it is about you have failed to recognize our borders, and thus we go to war. So when, again, if we narrow in on this map, then we can also see the Spanish doing just what we saw in that French map. Um, just like the French were saying the Pays de the Sene, we have the Spanish saying, here's the Tierra de las Carrizas, the Tierra de las Payayas. So they, too, are saying this is the land of these different Indian nations. So what's going to happen when the Spanish come and want to take up residence? Of course, they're going to arrive in South Central Texas. And if you pay close attention, uh, those Mission Presidio complexes appear at the same places as these shared encampments. They don't set up shop and hope Indians come to them. They go to where they know Indians already have these shared encampments. San Antonio is at the site. Um, of the first site of San Antonio is where there was a shared encampment of the Payaya. And it had long been there. And so, of course, that's where the Spanish go. And if we think about these missions, and here again, a huge map that if we look at, you know, in its entirety, it's very hard to tell. We zoom in, love that zoom, and you read the missionary records for the establishment of each of these missions. Each mission was a negotiated diplomatic alliance with a different confederated group of native peoples. And so as they're negotiating it, the natives that they're negotiating with are like, no, 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 we can't be too close to them. No, no, you, this has to be over here. And so each, there's a reason the missions are spread out in the way they are. And the native people are saying, no, we can't go there. That, we're not affiliated with them. We'll be here. And only these groups will be here. So each one is an individual diplomatic moment and a set of allies. And so when you then consider this landscape, how were the Spanish viewed by these native people? Well, they're going to set up their little villa. And they will be another ethnic enclave in this shared encampment. They are just one of multiple groups who have all come together in this area. So consider what the Franciscans will tell us, right? They will moan for years and years, oh, our missions are such a failure. Because the native people there are using the mission sites as they use their shared encampments. It is just one of many shared encampments within the domain, a much larger domain, of their lands. And so, of course, they come and go because we only go to shared encampments in that area at certain times when there's certain resources available. When those resources dry out, we leave. So they're not runaways. They're just using the mission site just as they would their shared encampments. They come together for group hunting and group hunt gathering. They come together for ceremonies, for healing. They go to see the doctor. Um, if you are exogamous bands, which you are, and so you've got to marry outside of your band, you've got to come together with multiple other bands so your sons and your daughters can meet somebody and can court and can find somebody to marry. And at these shared encampments, of course, political and economic alliances are renewed and negotiated again. And so, of course, in this world, the Spanish are just another group, one of other allies. They're not overlords. They're not controlling the native population there. Clearly, this is, the Franciscans are very aware of this, right? But they've also, if you think about that Spanish via, they have brought their families there, too. So we're all in this together. We're sharing resources. We're trying to get ahead. And we're also sharing defense. And one of the most striking things when you look at other Spanish provinces across the northern, the far northern provinces, is that it is only in Texas that the Spanish regularly supply horses and guns to the native people among whom they live. This is quite unusual. It was actually against the law in other Spanish provinces. Um, so why are they doing this? They are doing this because they share defense. I'm showing you this aerial picture of San Jose because what does it most look like when we see it from the air? 
it looks like a fort. It's got walls because they need defense. And so this is this key element of these shared encampments at San Antonio. And if we go back to that mission map and we zoom in anymore, you can see that right here, it tells us, oh, this is where our enemies enter. This is the gateway to enemy territory. So who are they worried about defending themselves against? The Apaches, my third uh, case study. In 1721, the Spanish will wake up to find a row of arrow shafts buried in the ground outside of the Presidio with red cloth flying through them. And it was the Apache way of saying, hello, you do know where you are, right? You're on our border. We just thought maybe you needed to know that. And it will be extraordinary. Again, let's go on to another map. Another big map that doesn't show us anything until we zoom in. And you see so nicely, there's little San Antonio, and then you've got the nice line that they're giving us, and then you can see all the various Apache settlements um, to the north. And um, they will spend a lot of time, those Presidial soldiers, going out and checking for the gateways into Apacheria and the gateways to Lumeria, uh, where they know the Apache worlds begin. So let's pause now and consider Apaches, another mobile group to whom we may not ascribe territory. In 1687, in 1686, I'm sorry, Alonso de Posada will record that the Apaches are the owners of all the plains which they call Cibola. The Apaches' great nation is so numerous and extensive that their rancherias extend for 800 miles from New Mexico to the lands of the Tejas. That extensive stretch of rancherias referenced by Posada was, in fact, a, an Apache form of border control. And again, I'm going to show big maps. And we zero in. And you can see San Antonio way down in the far bottom right corner. And then you can see the one momentary attempt by the Spanish to move into Apacheria at San Saba, the tiny little red presidio in the middle of the map. And then just, if, I'm not sure if everybody in the back of the room can see, but you can see Apache settlements across this landscape um, massive, controlling it. So this, these extensive uh, streams of rancherias was this way of controlling their lands. So mobility, we should not ever imagine, um, diminishes an Apache sense of homeland or their claims to territories. What you have is that, of course, each rancheria represents uh, an extended family, generally minimum 400 people who then join together in coalitions for warfare and raiding, most often to raid for horses because horses are absolutely essential to their mobility, to their defense, to their political economies. And so they come together for those moments. But when they disperse into these individual extended family groups, each family band has a rancheria from which they control very clearly demarcated hunting territories and farming lands. So we should keep in mind that the Lapan did farm. And what it means is that then if you spread out into all these individual rancherias, right, you are spreading out your land holding, you are spreading out your land management, and you are spreading out your border control. It is no coincidence that many Apache rancherias are located where they know that they are on the borders of Comancheria. And we know much of this, again, from Spanish records. Um, Jose Cortez will say of the Apaches, they all know with unmistakable certainty in which areas the surrounding rancherias should be living according to their well-known familiarity with the mountains, valleys, and water holes that they possess. In contrast, and I'm going to go back. The Spanish might know where the borders of Apacheria were, and they spent a lot of time patrolling those borders because they were worried about the horse raids. But they knew little to nothing about the lands beyond the borders. 
And that lack of knowledge speaks to the strength of Apache border defense. The Spanish certainly did make several efforts to try to track horse raiders. Um, and what you find it was, if you read the records of these expeditions is that it would lead to days spent wandering unfamiliar ground and encounters with very intimidating, huge aggregated um, Apache rancherias. I will give you one example from 1739. Um, an expedition marched for six weeks over 530 miles through Apacheria trying to find somebody um, to fight until they happened upon four La Pan and Mescalero rancherias with more than 2,000 people camped over three miles of the San Saba River. The Spanish force then immediately decided, time to go. Uh, they did a rapid about face and they said, let's get out of here. We're outnumbered a zillion to one. Um, and the entire march, they noted, they were under watch. Apache warriors were stationed on hilltops the entire time. And this surveillance lasted until they got back to San Antonio. It was a 15-day march, a very tense 15 days, that cost them many, many horses as the Apaches raided the horses from the expedition um, as payment for a very foolhardy invasion into their lands. The Apaches did worry about a different nation, not the Spanish. They worried about Comanches. But what is striking about the Comanches is that we tend to cast Apache-Comanche relations as some sort of unknowing blood feud that had lasted for centuries. But of course, it was far more simply border wars between two very powerful nations. And if you think about it, right, they both have very similar political economies. They both have raiding economies. And we need to understand raiding as a growth strategy, right? You can, it's a means of territorial expansion. It is a means of domination. So it is geopolitical just as, is, just as much as it is economic. And as I make you pause and think of that, I also want to make you pause to consider before accepting the traditional narrative that Comanches won the contest with Apaches. And I'm not going to say I'm going to let um, Professor Revaya Martinez tell us far more about Comanches in the afternoon, so I'm not going to, I'm looking at this from Apache perspective, but I think that Apache perspective is absolutely crucial because we tend to pay more attention to the Comanches, especially since Becca's Himalayan's wonderful book, The Comanche Empire. But we need to follow the Apaches because they simply translated their domain south to the Rio Grande and to Coahuila. And this migration south did not diminish in any way their power, especially to Spanish eyes. And so what you see, for example, in uh, the names of landmarks and hilltop ranges is all of a sudden uh, throughout Coahuila, you had landscapes that had certain native names, and now all of a sudden, it's the, the Paseo de Apaches. So it is the pass through which Apaches come to raid us. So the Apaches are simply moving their domain south. And this does not mean that their borders and their power are any less distinct or sound. So at the end of the 18th century, in 1799, Jose Corset Cortez, a Spanish military officer, will describe, and he's describing here only the La Pan Apaches. He will describe them as one of the most considerable nations in northern New Spain, a nation whose borders he could fix with certitude. They extend over a vast territory. To the west, they border the Llaneros. To the north, Comancheria. To the east, Coahuila. And to the south, they reach far beyond the Rio Grande. It is amazing to stop and consider, he is writing this in 1799, that the Spanish in Texas were part of the periphery of the largest, most prosperous European empire in all of the Americas. The Viceroyalty of New Spain had a population of one million colonists and mestizos and uh, two million natives within their population. The capital of Mexico's, whoops, different map, sorry, this is my Apache map. 
And there you can see what Cortez is telling us. Now, here's Mexico City. The capital of Mexico City, of the Viceroyalty of New Spain, was the most sophisticated metropolis in the Western Hemisphere with its spectacular Baroque architecture, its broad avenues, and one of the world's greatest universities. Yet if you were a Spaniard in Texas, it was far more important that you were living on the borders of Indian nations, not that you were part of this great European empire. Thus, Texas is a powerful reminder that in 1800, 300 years after Columbus, 25 years after the Declaration of Independence, more than 75% of North America was still in the hands of native nations. And you can see they will talk about the limits that they've expanded. But if we go back to this map of North America, 75% of the continent is still in the hands of native nations. 50% of what the United States is claiming in 1800 is still, in fact, in the hands of native nations. And I, two easy examples, the Iroquois and the Cherokee. And so what we need to remember then is that, in fact, that Berea map that I was showing you looks far more like this than anything in any of our textbooks. So I'm going to stop there, hopefully within time. And um, I believe I am now allowed to open the floor to questions. And you will tell me time for that too. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, And it's going to be exciting to try to see within this light. Yes. The mission, the mission San Saba, which was um, partially occupied by Apache but attacked by Comanches, where did that figure in terms of the boundary between the Apacheria and the Comancheria? Well, um, that's, it's decidedly in the heart of Apacheria at that point, um, but that confederated group of what the Spanish estimated to be at least 2,000 warriors, and of course it was actually 2,000 warriors representing 12 different nations, so it wasn't simply the Comanches, but Wichita's, Caddo's were there, a multitude of groups were there. Um, but what was mostly going on there was that, of course, the Apaches had been raiding north, and raiding Comanche settlements and other Wichita settlements for horses. And so what they saw San Saba as was that they thought, well, the Spanish have clearly just set up a supply depot for these Apaches who are now using supplies from the Spanish to raid us. So they went to wipe out the supply depot um, and to <laughs> tell the, and of course, that will make the Spanish go back. So they succeed in sending a very firm message. Um, to both Apaches and the Spanish in that point. Excuse me. There's discussion uh, nowadays about the impact of diseases on the uh, Native American population. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the change in populations and what might have occasioned it? Absolutely. Um, well, I think actually um, our views have changed um, quite a bit in the last 10 or 15 years that it used to be believed that, of course, diseases had, um, had been the main source of native population declines. And, it, and what happens in the Americas is generally deemed the worst demographic disaster in all of world history. Um, but what has come to be clearer, I think, with comparative history, though, is that, in fact, if we look at a comparison of what, happen what happens in North America and what happens in Latin America, what you can see are that native populations in the 17th century begin recovering in Mexico. And, in fact, native populations are growing faster than Spanish populations um, by the 18th century. So, in fact, um, they're recovering from an onslaught of disease. And yet native people in North America and within the bounds of the United States will not reach their population nadir until 1910. 
And so what this tells us is that, in fact, population decline was not primarily about disease, that it is about different systems of colonialism, and that, in fact, it is invasion, it is dispossession, it is the Indians being enslaved, because um, I don't know if people know about Andreas Resendez's um, latest book, The Other Slavery, which documents the enslavement of Native people. I, and there have been many books recently about the enslavement of Native people throughout the Americas. That we, in fact, can see a much more complex story of what is um, decimating Native populations. But what's also striking to think about, and this is what I remind my students all the time, is that if we look at, let's just say we do think about disease alone and we think about the Black Death in Europe, it will take over 300 years for European populations to regain the numbers lost from the Black Death. And so if we want to mark the nadir of Native populations in the United States as 1910, that means we actually have to wait till 2210 to see how Native populations recover. And then my students get really excited, and they're like, ooh, we're living in history then. Because, <laughs> And I also point out that between the 2000 and 2010 census, Native populations were the fastest growing identified minority group within the United States. So in fact, that recovery is ongoing. And so it's a very complex picture we're getting. And, um, and I should say, one of my friends, Jeffrey Osler, has a brand new book out um, just this summer called Surviving Genocide. And it's about all the different processes by which um, Native peoples um, were decimated in population numbers begin in North America. And so, uh, and it's actually just part one of his book, but so it's, it's going through from 1787 uh, through the end of the 19th century. So um, I try to remind my students that Native history, um, that there are, there are many tragedies and there are many losses, but in fact, this is a story of triumph and one of the greatest survival stories um, in the history of human populations. So um, I think it's good to keep in mind, I don't know, that, as my students would say, we're living in history, and the recovery is ongoing. One more, one more question. One more question. Okay. Oh. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple one. That last map, which I know you showed at the beginning as well. Okay. What 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 year? What are we talking about? What's the approximate time period? Yes. Um, it was made by a demographer who is at Stanford, and he dated it as about 1600. Um, of course, knowing which Indian nation, the Indian nations I study, I, w I w of course would dispute some of his, but what he's trying to tell us is a much the, the bigger picture that, in fact, we really can't see this landscape somehow as unoccupied, that every part of it is claimed, yeah. And that, again, we need to think about different political economies occupying those lands in different ways. But it's, um, it's, the demographer is a man, Matthew C. Snip. And, um, and actually, his, the map of uh, reservations was also his, although reservation lands have expanded um, since that map he drew, too, so. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much.